should go live on the, the, the scheduled one. I think it is. Everyone's there. Good morning, everybody. Let me know right out of the gate if you can see me and if I'm live. Um, good to see everybody. I can see you. Let's see. I can see you. Let's see who's here. MVG. Good morning, everybody in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Good morning and welcome. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Linda B. Linda, good to see you. I missed you yesterday. We had our Zoom thing and I missed you. Good morning. Good morning, Kira. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, I've been struggling. It's uh, It was another thing with updates, you know. I'm sure that you all live in this world, too, where things get updated and things change and you don't have the technical savvy to figure out what changed or how to fix it. But I think we got it now. Um, Kira, good to see you. Lori, happy you're there in Texas. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Catherine in Arizona. Good to see you. I missed you yesterday, too. Sheila, good to see you. You were on from Benton City, Washington. We had a great Zoom yesterday. It was super fun. We were just talking silly and telling stories, and it was a lot of um, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. It was it was really nice. I needed to reset a little bit. It was so nice to chat. And Penny in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Good morning, Penny. I don't think I've seen you for a while. Great to see you. Mom, there you are. Good morning in Granby, Connecticut. We will see you soon. Linda H., I just sent your monk's cloth yesterday, so that should be with you soon. I sent a yard over to you. Um, good morning in Massachusetts. Chrissy, good morning. I'm sorry I forgot to write you. I didn't forget. I just got crazy last night, but I will write to you today, and your thing is all set. Um, Crystal, good to see you again. Love these Chatty Camp chats. I do, too. I feel like they just can't go on long enough. I've been getting a lot of um, emails off of the thread and off of the Facebook page um, saying people are just loving the talks about Canada. I think we are all just dying, um, feeling such powerful sort of wanderlust, um, need to travel, need to get out. Somebody wrote this morning and said that she had canceled a trip um, the, to Canada in 2020 and that she had planned to do a lot of the things that we're talking about now and it's just the story of a few people who've written um, that they had these great plans in place last year to go and do some of this Cabot Trail and um, Cape Breton and Chetty Camp and all that stuff um, and then things things got shaken up to such an extent that a lot of people's plans rightfully changed and had to change. I'm really hoping that this is the year that we can all get together and make plans getting a lot of emails too saying um, as soon as it's time and as soon as it's smart to travel again um, you know that, that people would like to travel I keep getting this message too and I really appreciate it um, because you know how badly I want to plan things and um, plan things together and you know you know I was a tour guide before I had the kids and that was like a big big thing that was my career and I miss that so much. And I really have had so many ideas since we've been together here, uh, places that we could go and trips that we could make and things that we could do and link together. And I am, I have all of that in my head. So I'm just kind of waiting until the world um, settles down a little bit. And then I feel like we're gonna have so many possibilities to get together, to see each other, to have adventures, um, just to, to actually be together. So all of that is on the horizon. Just keep your eye it, on the light, not the bad light, not the walk toward the light, but the good light that's out on the horizon because it's all happening. So Linda, Chrissy, Crystal, Cynthia, good to see you again too. Good morning. Good morning, Donna in Nanton, Alberta. Good morning. I am live, my mom says. I was worried. I'm always worried. Monday and Tuesday, it was a thing. Lori, good morning. Robin LaForest, hello from Wisconsin. I love your name. I love your snowflakes. Welcome. Good to see you, Robin. April, good morning. You are on screen and live. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't flip out in that in that 30 second interval. Kira, Crystal, Sheila. Okay, so you're all chatting. That makes me happy. Tad, I have not forgotten. Um, I cannot wait to see you. I want to go to Tad's place in Saugerties, New York and do a video because he does the most amazing artistic punch needle and I want to film it and I want to visit. Um, I just lost two days of work this week because of um, the storm so I'm trying to regroup as quickly as I can but I definitely have not forgotten. I'm very very ramped up to do that. If you're on the Facebook page which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club, Tad often posts and his work is super artistic, proper artistic and fantastic and different. Um, and you are so much more sort of proficient at punch needle than I ever will be that 
I'm dying to see your methods in your great studio space. Lori, ordering the kisses we speak. Great. I, I still have some. I'm working on them now. The first, there's been a lot of orders for the kiss, and I'm really glad that you liked it. I just wasn't sure if it was the right thing for February. It was kind of a whim, you know, glasses of wine, thinking about romantic February things, uh, and it just it happened that way and I'm very glad that people seem to like it the first kits are going out now and I'm making more and I'm waiting on the door wool which is in the mail um, to come because I need to dye some more you know I did that really fancy hand dyeing I'll do a video on that too in the next couple of days to show you how I did that kind of dyeing because you should do it at home too it's super easy and fun but the next set of kits are going to be going out um, either tomorrow or Monday. I'm just waiting for that wool to come so I can do some more dyeing. But it will be very soon. Martha, good to see you. Cindy, I'm sorry I skipped over you. Good morning, Cindy. And Martha, it was great chatting yesterday. Martha was on the call too. It was super fun, super fun chat. And Carol is on. Just made it. Big storm, really. Oh dear, it's going around, isn't it? The big storms. It is kind of exciting though. I feel like we're having winter again. I feel like last year we didn't. I think I went two years without taking the kids sledding. There just wasn't enough snow. Um, and when there was, it was like icy and it went away in five minutes. And um, this time I feel like we're getting a proper, Kirsten, good morning. I feel like we're getting a proper winter. So listen, I have been working so hard on our trivia game for Friday night cocktail night and I feel sorry a little little piece of paper about to catch fire with this little fireplace um, I feel like it's going to be the greatest greatest fun again it's not a money game I will have the cards up later I'm still working on the document but there will be 50 images of hook drugs with all different kinds of trivia questions that are multiple choice and you will get um, you'll be able to download from the Facebook group from ribbonCandyHooking.com. If you want to email me directly because you're having trouble finding it at ribbonCandyHooking at gmail.com, by tonight I'll have the document ready. It's 50 images in one column, three columns, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 50. Second column, 50 different rugs that hopefully you haven't seen before. And in the third column, right next to the rug that it refers to, A, B, or C, multiple choice. And when we play the game, I'll be reading you a question and giving you the choices. And the commentary will be about famous rug hookers and designers, techniques, but also about music, architecture, gardening, religion, um, history, everything that you can think of. Um, all different subjects that I tied to the rugs that we're gonna be looking at together. So it's very mixed trivia and we're using a rug for each question as our sort of starting point, our pivot point to talk about a certain aspect of that rug and I give you a question. And again, there's no winners, we're all winners, but it's just fun. So that's coming along really well. It's quite good morning, Anne. It's quite a big project, but um, it's, re it's really fun. I hope we enjoy it and I hope it goes well. I'm going to be doing that with my mom, so that'll be extra, extra, extra fun. Yeah, it's going real well. So let's get right back to, uh, let's get right back up into Canada. And it occurred to me, I'll probably carry over into Canada um, again next week. Um, I'm going to see how far I can get closing up the Elizabeth LaFour um, conversation that we started on Tuesday since we Zoomed yesterday. But, and I want to get back to this fantastic Chetty Camp book. The link should be in the um, uh, video here under description. Uh, great, great, great book. I'm enjoying it immensely. It's a history book. It's a reading book. But for people who are rug hookers, it is, it's full of interesting information, anecdotes, small stories that are super quaint. Uh, I'm just enjoying reading it. You know, I love reading books, even when they're how-to books. Um, some are easier to read than others. This is just, this is the for me, the perfect bedside book. You know, it's very, very, very atmospheric. But then it occurred to me, we haven't gotten this week to Maude Lewis, to uh, George Edouard um, Tremblay, uh, to a couple of other Canadian artists who crossed over into rug hooking that I would like to talk about. So I put some of them into the trivia game as like a starting point for us to launch off into next week. But I think we're going to spend at least the beginning of next week still in Canada rambling around. Um, so let's go back to what we were talking about when we left off on Tuesday. We were talking about Elizabeth Lafour. I sort of fast forwarded in this book and I'm going to, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Just because when I started reading about her um, in the Trois Pignons, the museum, um, where there's a, a, her artwork and the artwork of a second person, what was her, her name, Marguerite something, 
not her artwork, but her fantastic collections. We were talking about that museum and about this particular body of work, uh, which was extraordinary because Elizabeth Lafour became a proper celebrity. You know, we talk all the time about Pearl McGowan and the tremendous amount of academic work that she did putting together the history of hook drugs and, and compiling patterns in a way that um, she saved them, she quantified them, uh, she made them available, she was selling them through Sturbridge Village, uh, people could buy kits and patterns. Um, she brought them to market. She brought the idea of rug hooking to market and she made it a thing again. Meanwhile, up in Canada, Elizabeth Lafour is doing something very different, parallel and different. Um, she is doing these epic, in terms of scale and quality, what, what they are calling tapestries um, that we would just be calling hook drugs, they're hooked. Um, but tapestry scale, extremely grand, large, detailed, uh, sort of photo realism quality to them of uh, biblical scenes, of celebrities, and she herself is becoming a celebrity because her work is so uh, well received and so visible. So we were talking about how she has, uh, her work is hanging at the Vatican, it's hanging at the White House, um, it's hanging at the at Buckingham Palace, you, her, her portrayal of the Queen, the last, the, the Queen Elizabeth II. Um, and she's done other members of the sort of British um, um, elite classes, royal cla royal people, titled people, um, and a lot of U.S. presidents, and we're going to come for that. Shoot, I forgot the magazine I really needed. We might have to come back to that point. But I've got everything else. So let's see. We left off talking about uh, her life. I concluded her simple biography. She died uh, at the age of 91 in Chetty Camp. And we were talking about uh, her career that started off with her just trying to help out her parents uh, money-wise and and copying a postcard from England, remember all this that came in the mail that was kind of monotone, colors, grays and browns, a sepia kind of postcard from uh, her brother's wife's mother. And her, uh, she ended up copying it six times because she sold it for $25, which was you know a, a princely sum. They said in one of the websites that it's a good phrase to use because it really was for that time. And then she went, uh, she caught the attention of the gallery owner who she would later marry. Um, let me pull that name up again. What was that? Kenneth, Kenneth Hansford. Um, and he really was a huge proponent, supporter, uh, cheerleader of her work and um, really challenged her by sort of giving her assignments to do that really challenged her artistic abilities and her technical skills. And in doing so, she just excelled from one platform to the next to the next. The last thing that we looked at, we talked about how she pulled 55 loops per minute, which is 3,300 loops an hour. That's extraordinary progress. And we looked at this piece from Mary Jane's Rugs. I love that blog site. We looked at this piece. Let me put it, my hand out of it. Um, and Mary Jane said when she saw this piece at the Elizabeth Lafour Museum, she said that it looked so realistic that she felt that her hand could reach out and get splinters from the wood, right? So that's where we left off. That was an amazing sort of a tribute to say something like that. So Lafour showed, um, I'm going to continue a little more in depth with her biography to catch up. Lafour showed particular prof proficiency and around 1940 she began following her own vision of design. Um, that was her era of sort of copying photographic work like the postcard. She immediately deviated from traditional patterns that were already popular. Again, we're going to return to the Chetty Camp book, but very simple, what you would expect, scroll borders, medallions, very simple rugs, fairly predictable. Um, it was in 1940 that she really started to deviate uh, from those kinds of designs and do something different. Now, this is different. This is quite different. We have talked about a lot of artists, proper artists. I'm thinking of Marguerite Zorak, um, who even earlier, like, you know, 20, 40 years earlier, already experimenting with rug hooking as a fine art painter and creating art for the wall. Well, Elizabeth is doing this at this point too. Different timelines, different places, right? In different sort of orbits of inspiration and overlap. So this is really new for this time in this place to be doing these kinds of designs. She hooked rugs uh, for sale in her immediate region for 14 years. Um, she was discovered, she did the gallery thing with Kenneth Hansford. Um, I'm just reviewing this, and it was, remember it was he who uh, encouraged her to do the portrait of Eisenhower, which I showed, I'll show it one more time, 
just for ketchups. And that was really a turning point because then they were invited to the White House. And at that point, she was very, very, very visible as a rug hooker. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say about her? All right, this is kind of repeat stuff, so I'm going to push on. In 1959, she created the United States presidential sort of rug. It was a tribute to presidential history at that point. I'm going to have to pause on that and come back to that on Monday because I forgot the magazine. I had pulled up the copy of Rug Hooking Magazine. I don't have it in my head. It's a whole article on this, and it was written by Jean Shepard. So to be continued, let's put the pause on that one line of thought because I will show you that rug hooking issue. The whole article is about presidential rugs, not just this one that Elizabeth IV did, but rugs that have been in presidents' homesteads, presidents who have uh, family members who have hooked and have had their rugs at home. We're going to return to that presidential theme on Monday. Uh, sorry, I forgot about that. But she is doing, she did her presidential rug to be continued, but she's also doing stuff like this that's obviously bringing her right to the front of um, sort of popular culture. Obviously, this is Jackie Kennedy. And look at how exquisitely done this is. And this is a black and white photo of Elizabeth standing next to this piece. You can also get a real feel for the scale of her pieces. They are enormous. And this is her working outside. It looks like a super pleasant day to be working on her Chetty Camp frame. Mine is in the other room. I should have brought it in here. But she is working, being able to hook as, as quickly as she did. Um, she is, she's working quickly, and she's producing enormous uh, pieces of enormous proportion, much larger. This one's a little bit smaller. This is for Pierre Trudeau, who is my boy Justin Trudeau's dad, of course, the former prime minister of Canada. Um, this is a photo of her presenting. Let me get it in focus. Her portrait of him. Why is it not in focus? Because I'm still in the lens, huh? There we go. Presenting her piece to him. Look at how proud her face looks. She's very dressed up on this event. Oh, interesting, Sheila. I'm going to have to check that one out, that Barbara Bush hooked rugs. Well, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if Barbara Bush hooked rugs. Um, I'm going to have to research this because Barbara Bush's, their main house, their summer house where she spent most of her time was in Kennebunkport, Maine. And you know who else is from Kennebunkport, Maine is Joan Moshimer. So those, those two people would have overlapped hugely. And she could have literally walked into town from the beautiful uh, Bush compound, which is right outside the center of town, and gone to Joan Moshimer's store. So I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Barbara Bush uh, hooked drugs. I'm going to research that as soon as I'm done. Thank you for that. That's a great thought. I would love to see her work too. I'm on it. I'm on it. It was not in the um, copy of the magazine, Jean Shepard's article. And it, the article certainly post-dated the era of Barbara Bush. I mean, she's, she's already passed away. Um, so I'm going to have to research that separately. That is a great lead and a great thought. And again, I would not be surprised with that Kenny Bunkport link in uh, common. Marguerite Gallant, that was the other woman who's represented in the museum at the uh, Trois Pignons. Um, her beautiful collections of everything. She collected collections. Do you know that feeling? Are you one of those? I, I'm one of those people, and I know that some of you are probably also uh, one of these people who collect collections. Um, the collections of Marguerite Gallant at the Trois Pignons uh, Museum, if you get there this year or next year, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, her collections, uh, from what I understand and from what I read and from the photos I looked at of the museum, this is a depiction of her here, Marguerite Gallant. And you can see it's the kind of a museum. You can see all of the articles in here. Um, there, is, there are going to be, obviously, a lot of hook drugs and things like that, too. But uh, you can see that all of the articles and collections in here really represent Acadian life, uh, the lifestyle. And they are integral and essential to getting that great feeling of what life was like in past days in this immediate region, right? So don't you love museums that look like this? that you know you walk in and you feel like you're in somebody's dining room these are the kinds of museums that i live for little museums where you can walk in and you know the last time i went to a little museum like this i was living in amsterdam and my kids were little and i turned my back for two seconds and teddy climbed up into the vignette and was a part of the vignette as if it was performance art and we got immediately escorted out of the museum and I never went back just for fear that they would recognize me or whatever. It's very, very stressful. 
Kirsten says, I have seen the bush rug listed as both hooked and needlepoint. Ooh, interesting. That's a good point. Um, you know, because equally, um, there was a Claire Murray store there. There was like, um, in Kenny Bunkport, a lot of these stores have closed. There was a very high-end needlepoint store there. Um, it's not there anymore. Joan Moshimer's not there anymore. Claire Murray's not there anymore. Uh, but it is possible sometimes that needlepoint rugs, which you often see, like monkeys with uh, palm trees and things like that, they can look like hooked rug, uh, hooked rug. So we will, um, <laughs> you understand the Teddy thing. It was so bad. It was so, oh, God, it was so bad. It's, it, it's making my hands shake just thinking about it. Guard came out of nowhere and just descended on us. So this is, uh, this is Jackie Kennedy in color. I mean, isn't that gorgeous? And look at the background. It's like a, chi it doesn't look like a Chinese screen. I mean, it really, it must be a Chinese screen. That is so lovely. Of course, in mid-century US, like all this sort of Japanois type stuff, Chinese, Asian, Japanese influence was really uh, in vogue. And of course, Jackie was the height of being in vogue. Now, these are some of the presidents. This is not the rug that I was talking about. Um, this is not the presidential rug. That is, an, that is, it's an epic, epic, not that this isn't good, but that is epic scale, a completely different composition. So we'll put that on hold and save that uh, for Monday. Uh, I was looking at this article um, on this blog site called Dull Tool, Dull Tool, Dim Bulb. Okay, Dull Tool, Dim Bulb. It's a blog spot. And there was an article on famous folk art hookers of Canada. And um, it completely, obviously, covered Elizabeth Lafour. I think the huge rug Barbara Bush made is the presidential, um, is in the presidential library. Okay, great. Okay, that's great, Cynthia. So I'm gonna I'm gonna follow that up as the first lead, and you do too if you if you feel like it. Um, it see how great it is when we brainstorm and for it snowballs and we get a little bit more each time. Wish she hooked drugs, but maybe she did. You never know. Uh, it sounds like it might be a needlepoint rug, but let's we'll see how it goes, and, and we'll hope that we're surprised, right? So this dull tube, <laughs> dull tool, dim bulb blog site uh, put these color photos up of Elizabeth Lafour, uh, and they really are gorgeous. So these are some of the single portraits, presidential portraits, and other portraits that she did. Here's her with a full size Jackie Kennedy in color, and then there is a few more I want to show you. Um, that one was one. Oh, maybe that was it, actually. That was it. The other one was the one I used of her in front of the crucifixion, um, which is also a beautiful piece. So we'll come back to those presidential rugs on Monday. In the meantime, with the time we have left now, I want to return to Chetty Camp. This book is just, this again, this book just is, it makes me crazy. It's so good. Uh, Crystal's mom worked on this book, right, in the 80s. Um, it's just gorgeous. The beginning chapters are informationable. We started out Monday talking about um, Chetty Camp. Who, who are the people of Chetty Camp? Where did they, we talked a little bit about where they came from. I did want to show you one more thing, and I think I, I didn't bring all my papers because I'm such a liberty gibbet. That's not really the word I want to say, but it's the word I must say. I'm going to show you one more thing when, um, um, on Monday. I just I wanted to show you one more reference to the Acadians and uh, where they came from and why they settled in Canada. Let's pick up with that on Monday. But this book in the early chapters talks about the geography, the landscape, sort of the topography, um, the early people, and the lead up to your grandmother. Um, sorry, Crystal. Um, the lead up to the culture of rug hooking as a cottage industry that would bring in extra income for this fishing community that otherwise had had nothing but fishing to rely on. Um, she did all the research for it. Oh, I love it. I love a thoroughly researched book, particularly when it's on rug hooking. That is the sweet spot. But there are great things in this book, um, things that are taken from, I think, previous books and um, pamphlets and stuff. I, cer I did these circles here to show you People were talking about the Chetty Camp frame. A Chetty Camp frame is um, similar to like a quilting frame. It's a floor frame, but a Chetty Camp frame will have gears on it. That seems to be right from the beginning. One of the integra integral things about the construction of a Chetty Camp frame is that it should have gears. It is going to be tight top to bottom, and then people do different things with the gap on the sides to tighten up the sides to get that four-way stretch, that tight as a drum stretch, but the Chetty Camp frame should have gears that go top to bottom, and that should be one of the distinguishing 
features of it. Interesting things like this that just show you, you know, we talk about this hooking with a piece of, um, with a bent nail and a piece of wood. It's actually showing you from the beginning how to do this. I can't recommend doing this, I have to say, but imagine, right? This one, number two, number three, you shape the thing a little bit and then you bend it over and you shape the handle. Now, we are so spoiled at this point with all of our choices of tools, um, fancy things, expensive things, but I can imagine it probably was difficult to hold something that wasn't super, super, super smooth for any length of time, and, you know, giving it a lot of pull and a lot of work. Um, how tough that would be. I imagine someone who was capable of making a hook like this was also capable of sanding it and refining it and probably the oils from your hand and your sweat over time made it a beautiful soft patina, very tactile thing to have in your hand, um, but maybe not quite as fine as some of the tools that are for sale today. So I consider ourselves very lucky that we have the choices that we have. So yesterday somebody, I think Kira, you said something about um, the sheep and oh no you said uh, when did they start using wool strips and my answer was and again t off the top of my head because i'm not an expert by any means but my thought is that they never used wool strips they always used wool and i found this interesting thing about um um that's that said in better detail what i tried to say yesterday oh crystal says i've inherited hooks made this way that my grandparents use um, they hold such a fine thin wool Okay, so yeah, so a little less pull when you're coming through. And of course, they're working on sacking or backing or um, hessian, you know, people will say in other places. So it's a much, it's a very open weave. They're not pulling through monk's cloth or through rug warp, something that would be super, super tight and difficult each time. And, and Crystal's saying, and pulling very thin um, um, gauged uh, wool through. So it seems like they had always used wool. And in this part of this chapter, it talks about how the majority of families would, of course, have had sheep, right? Partly for food, um, but also for wool. And then it's saying, and I'm very glad that it does because I was afraid I said the wrong thing yesterday, that in the earlier days, a lot of rug making, um, they were using the second best wool, right? Because the first best was used for clothing. And they're saying the lesser quality wool was obtained from the legs and the belly of the sheep. And that was what was used for rug making. So that, that was good information that I gave. I'm really happy that that was in there somehow, somewhere. But um, at the same time, this is the point with this m sort of mass production happening and this industry growing so quickly and becoming profitable so quickly, um, they had to start using, they had to get more sheep. And they were using Scottish sheep um, from Scots who had settled nearby. They were using their sheep and, and just getting a much larger number in so that all of the wool was the best wool. They were not using the belly and the leg stuff. They were using all of it the best wool because you can't make a super quality rug with inferior quality wool or secondary quality wool. So they, they knew that so early on that they really had to have the best supplies to make the best product. And thus they solved their problem by bringing in more sheep, different sheep, more sheep. So it also talks about carding and what they would be doing at home, women, what they could do at home as part of this process, you know, not buying supplies at stores, as part of this process to stay busy and to keep the thing going, to be able to keep the supplies coming in, refining your supplies, dyeing your supplies so that you could be hooking rugs as quickly as possible and get paid for them as quickly as possible and as often as possible. So it's saying a few women were still carding their own wool um, but as quantity and, of course, demand increased, most women, women would send their wool out to be carded. It was just easier for someone else to do it and to send it back to them. Uh, the wool was brought uh, to the carding mills by a mail carrier, so you would post it, and then the mail carrier brought it back when it was carded. So easy peasy, all these shortcuts were figured out early on so that women could stay hooking and not be worried about spinning and carding and all that do the parts that they could do easily and outsource everything else, which is a great business model. So uh, one of the things that they would do in, in nice weather was have spinning bees, right? So before, if you weren't super, super busy and you didn't have crazy expectations for how many rugs you could get done this season to sell, you would participate in spinning bees. This is a really sweet picture of a spinning bee. I mean, just what a nice event, you know, quilting bees, hooking bees, spinning bees. Uh, men had chopping bees where they chopped down trees, right, where they would nick the side of a bunch of them and then 
really knock one down and they would all go down like dominoes because they were all a little bit damaged. Super dangerous kind of a bee. But there were all kinds of bees because any chance to get together and socialize, particularly in cold climates and remote places like northern New England and Canada, always very, very welcome. And I wish that these days were still here. We get together for our hook-ins. Um, but I have a feeling that a bee was a completely different kind of a atmosphere. So the history of uh, dyeing the wool and the use of mordants um, has changed very much as the quality of their rugs improved. They had to keep improving. They had to keep figuring out um, how to make the rugs better because the market was there. They had a ready market and they had to make sure um, that what they were handing off to peddlers for sale in other places, in other cities, you know, in the U.S., sending it across the border, there was the ready market and they had to make sure the quality was good or they would lose um, the opportunity to sell. It would just go to somebody else, right, who had better, better uh, products. So around 1920, peddlers start showing up um, in Cape Breton. And some of them, we have the names in this book um, of lots of them. And it's just interesting to hear the names and read the names. I'm not going to go into all that because I hope that you get this book. It's, it's very pleasant reading. Uh, the people who settled in, um, the people settled, so the people who were uh, peddlers settled in the more sort of urban areas, the business areas like Halifax, Sydney, and New Waterford. Um, from these towns and cities, they could travel. And they extended their business into the countryside, of course, going door to door with wares to sell, but also looking to buy. So they were selling things. Their merchandise consisted of clothing, bed covers, dishes, watches, um, necklaces, all these, all these kinds of household things. They were carrying these things first on their backs and then um, transported by like horse-drawn carts, uh, like little traps, and eventually in trucks, like automobile, like engine-driven trucks. So it gets better and better for them too. The evolution of their job gets better and better. Um, so the merchandise, the rugs, are going to be bought up by peddlers and they're going to be resold. And the traveling salesmen, these peddlers, were very quick to realize that the rugs that they saw in the Chetty Camp homes, oh my gosh, it's after 12, I'll close this thought and then we'll come back to this on Monday, uh, were not only beautiful, they were valuable. Um, of course, this is the era of the arts and crafts movement in the United States where anything handmade, whether it's a rug or pottery or um, anything, anything handmade is, is gold. Um, they, the salesmen and the peddlers realize this too. So they're going into the Chetty Camp homes and they're bartering for rugs that are not even for sale. Um, they're bartering with merchandise that they already have. And this is very problematic because not all of these peddlers and salespeople um, are very sort of ethical or have a ton of integrity. They, they don't. I'm sure some of them do, but many of them don't. So they are tra trading items, uh, household items, for rugs that have taken, obviously, many, many hours to make. Um, and this is an example. It says, we'll paint a clear picture of the kind of bartering action. Uh, one woman exchanged seven rugs. Each of the rugs she exchanged were 10 foot square, 10 foot square, uh, for an expensive, sorry, an inexpensive winter coat. So that's a, bit, that's a bit of a stab in the heart, isn't it? I mean, that is truly awful. There are more stories about peddlers and bad business deals in the early days of Chetty Camp when peddlers would just barge right into these women's houses while their husbands were not home, and the women did not necessarily have the language to speak to them and communicate and did not always know the deal that they were making. This sounds like the story of settlers with Native Americans too, doesn't it? You're going in, you're speaking to someone, they don't understand a word you're saying, you accidentally make a deal. It's not a good deal for you and then the guy walks out with 10 of your rugs. Um, we're gonna continue with that thought on Monday when we come back to Canada. We don't have coffee time tomorrow, we have cocktail time tomorrow. Be looking later, you need this book here, you do, the link is in the description of this video. Come back to this video later because I will have posted the link or go straight to Ribbon Candy Hooking to download your trivia card for tomorrow night. Don't miss trivia night. It's the best thing, the best game that I've put together for us yet. Super, super, super fun. The cards are free. You're just downloading it or you're opening it up on your computer and switching between me and or just listening to my voice and then looking at your thing and making multiple choice, whatever you want to do, print it or just look at it. But um, there's going to be 50 rugs shown, so the document's about 10 pages long. 
um, be looking for that later today. That will appear between like around dinner time today, um, Eastern Standard Time. A little more work to do on it. I will see you tomorrow night for Trivia Night. It is going to be a blowout fun night. It's going to be an extended episode, as always, on Fridays. That is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please like this video. Please subscribe to this channel. I work so hard to get this to you and to give us fun stuff to do during these quiet times. I will see you tomorrow night for Trivia Night. Don't forget to download your card. If you have any questions, write to me in the Facebook group or at ribbancandyhooking at gmail.com.